A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, Section 47. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Miles Up the Nile by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 16, Abu Simbel, Part 2. How well I remember the restless excitement of our first day at Abu Simbel! While the morning was yet cool, the painter and the writer wandered to and fro, comparing and selecting points of view, and superintending the pitching of their tents. The painter planted his on the very brink of the bank, face to face with the colossi and the open doorway. The writer perched some forty feet higher on the pitch of the sand slope, so getting a side view of the façade and a peep of distance looking up the river. To fix the tent up there was no easy matter. It was only by sinking the tent pole in a hole filled with stones that it could be trusted to stand against the steady push of the north wind, which at this season is almost always blowing. Meanwhile the travelers from the other dahabiyas were tramping backwards and forwards between the two temples, filling the air with laughter and waking strange echoes in the hollow mountains. As the day wore on, however, they returned to their boats, which one by one spread their sails and bore away for Wadi Halfa. When they were fairly gone, and we had the marvellous place all to ourselves, we went to see the temples. The smaller one, though it comes first in the order of sailing, is generally seen last, and seen therefore to disadvantage. To eyes fresh from the abode of Ra, the abode of Hathor looks less than its actual size, which is, in fact, but little inferior to that of the temple at Dur. A first hall, measuring some forty feet in length by twenty-one in width, leads to a transverse corridor, two side chambers, and a sanctuary seven feet square, at the upper end of which are the shattered remains of a cow-headed statue of Hathor. Six square pillars, as at Dur, support what, for want of a better word, one must call the ceiling of the hall, though the ceiling is, in truth, the superincumbent mountain. In this arrangement, as in the general character of the bas-relief sculptures which cover the walls and pillars, there is much simplicity, much grace, but nothing particularly new. The façade, however, is a daring innovation. To those who have not seen the place, the annexed illustration is worth pages of description, and to describe it in words only would be difficult. Here the whole front is but a frame for six recesses, from each of which a colossal statue, erect and lifelike, seems to be walking straight out from the heart of the mountain. These statues, three to the right and three to the left of the doorway, stand thirty feet high and represent Ramesses the second and Nefertari his queen. Mutilated as they are, the male figures are full of spirit, and the female figures full of grace. The queen wears on her head the plumes and disc of Hathor. The king is crowned with the shent and with a fantastic helmet adorned with plumes and horns. They have their children with them, the queen her daughters, the king his sons, infants of ten feet high, whose heads just reach to the parental knee. The walls of these six recesses, as they follow the slope of the mountain, form massive buttresses, the effect of which is wonderfully bold in light and shadow. The doorway gives the only instance of a porch that we saw in either Egypt or Nubia. The superb hieroglyphs which cover the faces of these buttresses, and the front of this porch, are cut half a foot deep into the rock, and are so large that they can be read from the island in the middle of the river. The tale they tell, a tale retold in many varied turns of old Egyptian style, upon the architraves within, is singular and interesting. Ramesses, the strong and truth, the beloved of Amun, says the outer legend, made this divine abode for his royal wife, Nefertari, whom he loves. The legend within, after enumerating the titles of the king, records that his royal wife who loves him, Nefertari the beloved of Mot, constructed for him this abode in the mountain of the pure waters. On every pillar, in every act of worship pictured on the walls, even in the sanctuary, we find the names of Ramesses and Nefertari coupled and inseparable. In this double dedication, and in the unwanted tenderness of the style, one seems to detect traces of some event perhaps as some anniversary, the particulars of which are lost forever. It may have been a meeting, it may have been a parting, it may have been a prayer answered or a vow fulfilled. We see at all events that Ramesses and Nefertari desired to leave behind them an imperishable record of the affection which united them on earth, 
and which they hoped would reunite them in Amenti. What more do we need to know? We see that the queen was fair, that the king was in his prime. We divine the rest, and the poetry of the place at all events is ours. Even in these barren solitudes there is wafted to us a breath from the shores of old romance. We feel that love once passed this way, and that the ground is still hollowed where he trod. We hurried on to the great temple without waiting to examine the lesser one in detail. A solemn twilight reigned in the first hall, beyond which all was dark. Eight colossi, four to the right and four to the left, stand ranged down the center, bearing the mountain on their heads. Their height is twenty-five feet. With hands crossed on their breasts, they clasp the flail and crook, emblems of majesty and dominion. It is the attitude of Osiris, but the face is the face of Ramesses II. Seen by this dim light, shadowy, mournful, majestic, they look as if they remembered the past. Beyond the first hall lies a second hall supported on four square pillars. Beyond this again a transverse chamber, the walls of which are covered with colored bas-reliefs of various gods. Last of all, the sanctuary. Here, side by side, sit four figures larger than life. Ptah, Amun-Ra, Ra, and Ramesses deified. Before them stands an altar, in shape a truncated pyramid, cut from the solid rock. Traces of color yet linger on the garments of the statues, while in the walls on either side are holes and grooves such as might have been made to receive a screen of metalwork. The air in the sanctuary was heavy with an acrid smoke, as if the priests had been burning some strange incense and were only just gone. For this illusion we were indebted to the visitors who had been there before us. They had lit the place with magnesian wire, the vapor of which lingers long in these unventilated vaults. To settle down then and there to a steady investigation of the wall sculptures was impossible. We did not attempt it. Wandering from hall to hall, from chamber to chamber, now trusting to the faint gleams that straggled in from without, now stumbling along the light of a bunch of candles tied to the end of a stick, we preferred to receive those first impressions of vastness, of mystery, of gloomy magnificence, which are the more profound for being somewhat vague in general. Scenes of war, of triumph, of worship pass before our eyes like the incidents of a panorama. Here the king, borne along at full gallop by plumed steeds, gorgeously caparisoned, draws his mighty bow and attacks a battlemented fortress. The besieged, some of whom are transfixed by his tremendous arrows, supplicate for mercy. They are Assyrian people, and are by some identified with the northern Hittites. Their skin is yellow, and they wear the long hair and beard, the fillet, the rich robe, fringed cape, and embroidered baldric, with which we are now familiar in the Nineveh sculptures. A man driving off cattle in the foreground looks as if he had stepped out of one of the tablets in the British Museum. Ramesses, meanwhile, towers, swift and godlike, above the crowd. His coursers are of such immortal strain as were the coursers of Achilles. His sons, his whole army, chariot and horse, follow headlong at his heels. All is movement and the splendor of battle. Farther on we see the king returning in state, preceded by his prisoners of war. Tied together in gangs, they stagger as they go, with heads thrown back and hands uplifted. These, however, are not Assyrians, but Abyssinians and Nubians, so true to the type, so thick-lipped, flat-nosed, and woolly-headed, that only the pathos of the expression saves them from being ludicrous. It is naturalness pushed to the verge of caricature. A little farther still, and we find Ramesses leading a string of these captives into the presence of Amun-Ra, Mat, and Conus. Amun-Ra, weird and unearthly, with his blue complexion and towering plumes, Mott wearing the crown of Upper Egypt, Conus by a subtle touch of flattery depicted with the features of the king. Again to the right and left of the entrance, Ramesses, thrice the size of life, slays a group of captives of various nations. To the left, Amun-Ra, to the right, Ra-Hamarches, approve and accept the sacrifice. In, this, in the second hall we see, as usual, the procession of the sacred bark. Ptah, Kem, and Bast, gorgeous in many-colored garments, gleam dimly like figures in faded tapestry from the walls of the transverse corridor. But the wonder of Abu Simbel is the huge subject on the north side of the great hall. 
This is a monster battle piece which covers an area of 57 feet and 7 inches in length by 25 feet 4 inches in height and contains over 1,100 figures. Even the heraldic cornice of cartouches and asps, which runs round the rest of the ceiling, is omitted on this side, so that the wall is literally filled with the picture from top to bottom. Fully to describe this huge design would take many pages. It is a picture gallery in itself. It represents not a single action, but a whole campaign. It sets before us with Homeric simplicity the pomp and circumstance of war, the incidents of camp life, and the accidents of the open field. We see the enemy's city with its battlemented towers and triple moat, the besiegers' camp and the pavilion of the king, the march of infantry, the shock of chariots, the hand-to-hand -hand melee, the flight of the vanquished, the triumph of Pharaoh, the bringing in of the prisoners, the counting of the hands of the slain. A great river winds through the picture from end to end and almost surrounds the invested city. The king in his chariot pursues a crowd of fugitives along the bank. Some are crushed under his wheels. Some plunge into the water and are drowned. Behind him a moving wall of shields and spears advances with rhythmic step to the serried phalanx, while yonder, where the fight is thickest, we see chariots overturned, men dead and dying, and riderless horses making for the open. Meanwhile the besieged send out mounted scouts, and the country folk drive their cattle to the hills. A grand frieze of chariots charging at full gallop divides the subject lengthwise, and separates the Egyptian camp from the field of battle. The camp is square and enclosed, apparently, in a palisade of shields. It occupies less than one-sixth part of the picture, and contains about a hundred figures. Within this narrow space the artist has brought together an astonishing variety of incidents. The horses feed in rows from a common manger, or wait their turn and impatiently paw the ground. Some are lying down. One, just unharnessed, scampers round the enclosure. Another, making off with the empty chariot at his heels, is intercepted by a couple of grooms. Other grooms bring buckets of water slung from the shoulders on wooden yokes. A wounded officer sits apart, his head resting on his hand, and an orderly comes in haste to bring him news of the battle. Another, hurt apparently in the foot, is having the wound dressed by a surgeon. Two detachments of infantry marching out to reinforce their comrades in action are met at the entrance to the camp by the royal chariot returning from the field. Ramesses drives before him some fugitives, who are trampled down, seized, and dispatched upon the spot. In one corner stands a row of objects that look like joints of meat, and near them are a small altar and a tripod brazier. Elsewhere, a couple of soldiers, with a big bowl between them, sit on their heels and dip their fingers in the mess, precisely as every fella does to this day. Meanwhile, it is clear that Egyptian discipline was strict, and that the soldier who transgressed was as abjectly subject to the rule of stick as his modern descendant. In no less than three places do we see this time-honored institution in full operation, the superior officer energetically flourishing his staff, the private taking his punishment with characteristic disrelish. In the middle of the camp, watched over by his keeper, lies Ramesses' tame lion, while close against the royal pavilion a hostile spy is surprised and stabbed by the officer on guard. The pavilion itself is very curious. It is evidently not a tent but a building, and was probably an extemporaneous construction of crude brick. It has four arched doorways, and contains in one corner an object like a cabinet, which has two sacred hawks for supporters. This object, which is in fact almost identical with the hieroglyphic emblem used to express a royal panegyric or festival, stands no doubt for the private oratory of the king. Five figures kneel before it in adoration. To enumerate all or half the points of interest in this amazing picture would ask altogether too much space. Even to see it, with time at command and all the help that candles and magnesium torches can give, is far from easy. The relief is unusually low, and the surface, having originally been covered with stucco, is purposely roughened all over with tiny chisel marks, which painfully confuse the details. Nor is this all. Owing to some kind of saline ooze in that part of the rock, the stucco has not only peeled off, but the actual surface is injured. 
it seems to have been eaten away, just as iron is eaten by rust. A few patches adhere, however, in places and retain the original coloring. The river is still covered with blue and white zigzags to represent water. Some of the fighting groups are yet perfect, and two very beautiful royal chariots, one of which is surmounted by a richly ornamented parasol canopy, are as fresh and brilliant as ever. The horses throughout are excellent. The chariot frieze is almost panathenaic in its effect of multitudinous movement, while the horses in the camp of Ramesses, for naturalness and variety of treatment, are perhaps the best that Egyptian art has to show. It is worth noting also that a horseman, that rara avis, occurs some four or five times in different parts of the picture. The scene of the campaign is laid in Syria. The river of blue and white zigzags is the Orontes. The city of the besieged is Kadesh or Cadiz. The enemy are the Keta. The whole is, in fact, a grand picture epic of the events immortalized in the poem of Pentar, that poem which M. de Rouget has described as a sort of Egyptian Iliad. The comparison would, however, apply to the picture with greater force than it applies to the poem. Pentar, who was in the first place a courtier and in the second place a poet, has sacrificed everything to the prominence of his central figure. He is intent upon the glorification of the king, and his poem, which is a mere paean of praise, begins and ends with the prowess of Ramesses Mer Amun. If, then, it is to be called an Iliad, it is an Iliad from which everything that does not immediately concern Achilles is left out. The picture, on the contrary, though it shows the hero in combat and triumph, and always of colossal proportions, yet has space for a host of minor characters. The episodes in which these characters appear are essentially Homeric. The spy is surprised and slain, as Dolan was slain by Ulysses. The men feast and fight and are wounded, just like the long-haired sons of Achaea, while their horses, loosed from the yoke, eat white barley and oats, hard by their chariots, waiting for the dawn. End of section 47